<laughs> so, okay. I was telling Lisa how nervous I was, but I think it's because I, I didn't really know what this gathering of people was like, and it's nice to see friendly faces. I love to talk about Midwifery, free, and that's, that's not a problem. I just hope that you find the information you came to hear about and, and maybe a story or two as well. Um, midwife is, is a word that sometimes gets misused, and that's how I decided I'd, I'd start the talk. Uh, I was listening to CBC last week, and they were talking about something when they used the word midwife. And I realized that a lot of people use the word midwife in terms of to give birth, right? And midwife actually means to be with woman. So my role is to be with woman, women, and uh, I'm done giving birth. And so um, CBC was using it in the sense of there was this uh, industry, and they have this new idea for the environment. And they say this industry is going to be the midwife for this new idea, and I and I was thinking about no, if that were the case, then it would you know be the woman who has the knowledge and who has is going to give birth to this new idea, and the industry is simply the middle person that helps it happen. And I was going over my talk this morning with my 15 year old daughter, and she said that makes midwives sound really you know not that important. If you're just the middle person who's there and that's all you do is facilitate the idea, then you're not, you're not making yourself so important. And I, well, that's a 15-year-old girl for you too. But um, I said, I don't need to be important. You know, as midwives, that is what we're about. We're there to empower women. It's, it's not about us. It's to empower them in their maternal health, to empower them through their labor and their birth, and to be with them in the postpartum. So although it's a wonderful job that I absolutely love, it really is my job to empower other women. So if someone asks you what a midwife is, you can be a midwife. All you have to do is be with another woman and help her through something, and you're a midwife. Um, midwives, as you can guess, have been around for centuries. They used to be your grandmother or your girlfriend or your next door neighbor in a pinch. But uh, midwives in this country were legislated 21 years ago, right now. So that's not very old, that's very recent. And I think it's why there are still a lot of misconceptions about midwives. You know, a lot of our clients come into care and their families are all worried because they associate midwives with home birth and their families all think that's unsafe. And I'll address that later, but there are a lot of misconceptions. And our healthcare system in Ontario have been paying for midwives for 21 years. So there's no cost to the woman. 21 years ago, you had to hire a midwife, find someone to do it. But in Ontario, we've, we've been around um, since 1994. And just to give you a history, because that's what the talk was labeled, although a history I find not the most exciting part of midwifery, but it is for the women, the midwives, who brought it into our province. Ontario was the first province to get midwifery in Canada. And it was the result of a baby death in the late 1980s. So there were some midwives in Toronto that were doing home births for clients. And there was a, a, a midwife doing a birth on Toronto Island, and it was, um, it was a bad outcome, and the baby died. And the family chose to sue not the midwife, but the province, because they felt like if midwifery had been legislated and supported by the whole healthcare system, their baby wouldn't have died. It is one of the most emotional, it gives me goosebumps, cases where something truly wonderful came out of something truly horrible. Um, so it took a few years um, to have the case pushed through the courts. And in 1991, it became legal, but it didn't become funded until 1994. So we're the first province to have it. There are every other province except for Prince Edward Island and the Yukon that don't have midwives. They're legal in every province, but they're not funded. And that being said, New Brunswick as well is legal, legislated midwifery, but not funded. So there are no midwives practicing in New Brunswick either. But every other province. Here in Ontario, we have three colleges of midwifery in McMaster and in Toronto and at Laurentian in Sudbury is where you can go to school to become a midwife. It's a, a four-year Bachelor of Midwifery Sciences. Most of... Um, I didn't even think I was going to talk about this, but there you go. <laughs> we are in a university. So most of uh, the midwives or the students who get into midwifery have it as a second degree. Many of us have Bachelor of Arts or Bachelor of Science beforehand, and then get accepted into the program, which is a four-year midwifery of science program. 
Uh, it's very hard to get into the School of Midwives because of the fact that a large part of our training is on hands training with mentors and preceptors. We only have 1,400 midwives in the province, so it's hard to have enough to have these huge schools. So there's only 30 students in each of those, 30 to 35 students in each of those three schools every year. That's a very small number to try and uh, to be one of the many women who want to get into to becoming a midwife. So it's a hard program to get into. That being said, you can get directly into it from high school. If you have the right sciences and the right marks, you can get in, but it's very difficult. Um, they look at your life experience, they look at your um, undergraduate work, they, so, but you could. There's occasionally a very young midwife that comes through. Um, so that's to get, I mean, yeah, if you have any questions, actually I'm more interactive than speaker, but that's how you get into the School of Midwifery. Uh, so there are 2,000 midwives across Canada, 1,400 here in Ontario. The uh, tenets of midwifery, there are three things that define a midwife in Ontario and, and in Canada these days. And the three things are choice of birthplace, continuity of care, and informed choice. We designed this model when we decided to start uh, the whole program of midwifery in Ontario. We had Dutch midwives come and show us how they set up midwifery in, in Holland and how they practiced. They're a country where you, you don't have any choice. You always go to the midwife. And, and then from there, if there were complications, you go on to an obstetrician. But midwifery is your first and, and first line choice. Here in this country, uh, when you decide that you'd like a midwife, uh, usually the joke in Kingston is you have to call before you actually make the baby. <laughs> because we have such long waiting lists at our clinic to get in. So women try that. They try and make like, okay, is there any spots in July? And then they try and get pregnant you know, 41 weeks before that. But uh, here, you can come as soon as you're pregnant, you sign up, you, what we have is an admission form online, so you go online, you fill it in, it gets sent in, and we have a whole stack every month to go through. And if you can imagine, we're always planning our lives. Like my life is planned right now until January 2016 because I have clients already booking for September 2015, so I have to know well in advance what my schedule is. So you can fill in the online form. You can be going to your family doctor, and family doctors often uh, refer patients at 28 weeks to an obstetrician or someone else. Um, so there's many different ways to come into a midwife. You can be referred from another caregiver, or you can sign yourself up online. As I said before, one of the misconceptions is that women have to hire a midwife, and it's completely covered by OHIP, so that's a wonderful, you know, makes it available to all women. Um, just a funny little joke, because I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to loosen everybody up. Um, we used to just take people as soon as they called in. So if someone would get pregnant and they'd call in, and we'd, we'd, we'd be taking them in, and we'd be taking them in, and then we got full, and so we wouldn't take any more. All of a sudden, we realized our population of women that we were caring for was predominantly teachers. <laughs> we were like, what is going on with this? And we realized that teachers are really good planners. <laughs> you know, they know how to, they plan to get pregnant on summer holidays, they, and they call right on time. And we were losing a whole population. We lost the hippies, we lost the immigrants. So we've now got a new process where we put everyone on the list, and we try and prioritize, uh, especially low-income women that can benefit from the services we offer, as well as the home visits and all of the antenatal and, and postpartum support. Uh, yeah, new immigrants is certainly a population some of us are, are trying to reach out more to. Young moms, we have 14, 15 year old moms that definitely need the resources that we give. And uh, also we just try and diversify so we're reaching as many women as we can. Um, when um, choosing, let's talk with, when uh, the three tenets I started with, the continuity of care, the choice of birthplace, and informed choice. Informed choice, I think a lot of universities talk about informed choice now as well. I find it is a very exciting idea. We have half an hour to an hour long appointments with women, so we're really lucky to not be confined to that 10 minutes that doctors and obstetricians get confined to. And in that time, we do a lot of teaching. So where you might go to your, your doctor and have to have something happen in your pregnancy, a regular blood draw, they just do it. And the woman goes out thinking, I'm not sure what that was for, but I got it done. And with midwives, we really work hard to tell you why we're doing the blood draw. If you're at risk, maybe you should do it. If you're not at risk, it's a choice not to have it done. 
Women find that a really exciting idea, but they actually have a hard time with it when it comes to, to the practical application of it. We are so used to, in our healthcare system, just doing what we're told. And although it's a nice idea, when you give women a choice about their, their pregnancy and their care, they might know for themselves what they want, but they all of a sudden they feel this responsibility for their unborn child. And they just they still look at you and say, but what would you do? And it's, it's, really, it's really difficult, but I always tell women that I think informed choice gives them a start to being a parent, because they're gonna to have to make all sorts of choices with their, their child about schools and vaccinations, so it's a good start. So one of our tenets of midwifery is informed choice, and we really mean that. We've had situations that are quite uncomfortable where a woman is choosing to have a home birth, it's not of our, our, our best recommendation would be that they have a hospital birth, but our mandate is we will not leave them in, in labor or birth or care. We cannot leave them. Even though I document it, it's against my recommendation, um, from the College of Midwives, I must stay with them and attend them at that birth. So it's, it's a big part of what we do is, is a lot of teaching. I brought some of the things we um, have time for in clinic to do a lot of teaching, so you'll see some basic things if you want to come look. But we also have a lot of my equipment. Not all of it. I left two bags in the car. But <laughs> this goes to talk about informed um, choice of birthplace. So in this province, we're still only doing about 20% of home births. So all those myths about midwife equals home birth, we're doing 80% at the hospital. So we do a lot of birth at the hospital. But uh, home birth we feel strongly about. We've had over 25,000 home births since midwives were legislated in this province, and they've been studied, they've been researched by lots of different professionals, as well as insurance companies, because we have to have insurance. And home birth, we believe strongly, is as safe as a hospital birth. When the person is screened, so we only do home birth when it's a safe, potentially client and baby, um, people are well screened when it's a safe environment. We don't do home birth outside of a 30 minute radius of KGH. And we bring everything with us, and I know it's hard to believe, KGH is a level three hospital. But everything I have in the trunk of my car, I always say, is a level one hospital. There's no medications I'm missing, there's no equipment I'm missing that you wouldn't find in a level one hospital. So I started my practice in Grimsby, Ontario, and it's really small. You know, in the middle of the night, when you're in the little hospital, West Lincoln, Grimsby, and something goes wrong, there's not a NICU team, there's no OB, he's at home in his bed, sound asleep, or she, and you're it. So I feel quite confident that my trunk can back me up, and I also have another midwife. There's two midwives at every birth, home or hospital. So I'm with the woman laboring, and just before the baby comes out, I call my backup midwife, and she's there as well for the birth. Just because we have two patients, we'll have a mom and a baby very shortly, we want to have two midwives. Um, so yeah, home birth is, is a wonderful, lovely option. It doesn't always work out that there's two midwives. Last week I went, because people like stories, I like stories. Um, I went to check a woman who was planning a birth at KGH, and I walked, and she sounded like she wasn't moving along, so I said I'll be there in 20 minutes, just do a home check, usually I do a home check if, it, if there's time. And then we go to hospital when she's really getting into labor. I walk through the door, and four minutes later, we had a baby in the bathtub with no gloves, no equipment, or just me and the woman. <laughs> so they do happen like that, and, and it's wonderful. It's a real gift to the family, but to me as well. Continuity of care uh, perhaps isn't quite as exciting, but what it means when you come to midwife is that you will see myself and my midwife partner throughout your pregnancy. One of us will be with you at your birth, and then you stay with us until six weeks postpartum. A lot of people love the postpartum part of midwifery because we come, you can even have a hospital and go home three hours later, that's fine. We come and see you within 24 hours. We see you on day three, we see you on day five, we see you on day seven, and usually between seven and 10, one more visit at home. If you think about it, the people who don't have midwives go to the hospital, and it's unfortunate that our healthcare system is like this, it's not fair. Um, they go to the hospital, have a baby, they're discharged from KGH within 24 hours, unless there's a complication or a C-section, usually it's two days. And then no one sees them until one week later, the family doc sees them. If they have any questions or any concerns in that time, their only choice is to go to emerge uh, or call telehealth or one of those options. So as a new mom, one visit up to seven weeks, up to, sorry, seven <coughs> days, it's not a lot of contact with a, with a healthcare provider. And certainly, as you can guess, we advocate breastfeeding 
and it's, uh, it's a long stretch for a first-time mom to figure out breastfeeding by themselves um, when they're discharged from the hospital. So we have a very high success rate of breastfeeding, and uh, yeah, it's a really important part of our care. Good for dads, too. Good for dads? Mm-hmm. In the postpartum? Mm -hmm. Can you expand on this? <laughs> help me? I have a very, I had, I, had a, I had a midwife with um, the Kingston Community Midwives, and my partner, my husband, is actually much more anxious than I am, and he was very much looking forward to when the midwives came for all his list of questions. <laughs> <laughs> but I was reading, oh, she's fine, she's fine, don't worry, she's fine. Not sure. <laughs> when is Kelly coming? <laughs> so it was very good for him, actually. He very much liked having that constant contact. It's probably more important for him than me. Uh, yeah, no, they, they do. The funny thing about dads, it's often the dad that hesitates about a home birth. That's it. I've come up with this new theory just in the last few months. Because it's often the dad that's more, well, it is more often the dad that's more anxious about a home birth than the woman herself. Of course, it is the woman in her body and she feels powerful. But I think in the last few months I developed a theory that dads in a pregnancy a labor delivery situation, their sole re or partner, I should say partner, women and men, partner the, the laboring women, their sole responsibility is getting that person to the hospital. That's their job, bottom line. So they think, okay, deposit it in front of KGH, I'm done. <laughs> so when I take away that role by saying, we're just all going to stay home, or you're welcome to stay home, and they're like, what's my role? <laughs> they don't know what it is. But we work a lot, we have home birth information nights, not to convince anybody, but to inform. People don't realize, they think, I think we bring a piece of string and some scissors with us to a home birth. We bring a lot of things to a home birth. Um, so yeah, there, um, yeah, coming up to my last slides. Um, I think on the um, poster about midwifery today in this little talk, there was also a, a comment about where midwifery stands in our own community of Kingston. I've only been in Kingston for two and a half years. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, Sandra was at church on Sunday because she reminded me that I was speaking today <laughs> when we passed the piece. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been here two and a half years, and it's been a different community to work in. As I said, I came from the Niagara Region Level 1 Hospital. KGH is a, a teaching hospital, as you well know, and it's been an exciting place to practice. There are always OBs, uh, medical students, OB residents, everyone to converse with. And it's, uh, we're respected there as midwives, we're part of the team, we work together. And I, I find it fascinating to always be able to talk ideas with all sorts of caregivers. I've worked in hospitals where midwives still are not accepted. And so there's no speaking with the other medical people on the floor. It's very much for our own community and it's, it's not nearly as exciting as KGH. That being said, there's a there's a hold on the number of births that happen here in Kingston. We are, you are, a retirement community. So the number of 2,000, 2,300 or so of births that happen in the city per year hasn't changed in a very long time. So that being said, more people are finding out about midwives and want to come to midwives, but that means there's not enough births happening for the students that are at, uh, at the hospital. So there's been a, a bit of a tug and a pull between midwives and um, the, the women that are going to obstetricians that want to come to midwives because that's why we have so few. We have to only allow so many in each month. And there was a campaign this past year, I don't know if any of you saw it, but some consumers, some people who, who've had midwifery care, have worked hard to help our numbers grow at the hospital, to allow midwives to do more deliveries. It's been successful and the hospital is also very excited about it. And we now are a growing practice. We have more midwives and we're, our, our waiting list is shrinking. It's still 20, 30 people a month that are on the list that don't get midwifery care. Doesn't, it's, it's hard to make sense of that when you think we're in a country where if it's covered by your health care system, it should be available to all women. Women should have choice as to who cares for them. And family docs are delivering less and less. Um, and really, you, uh, midwives are at the same level in skill and knowledge as family docs, and, and uh, the women have to make a choice between those two. So our lists are growing as well because family docs are delivering less. Um, so yeah, I think that's m as much as an overview. I have no idea if I've spoken five minutes or 10 minutes or 20 minutes, but um, yeah, there's uh, a lot more I could say about it. I think it's a wonderful vocation, and I guess I haven't spoken to that. We are on call 24 hours a day and seven days a week, and I um, find that hard sometimes, but I love my job so much that it's a compensation for how many hours I'm on call. 
And when I'm on call, I'm not always working. Sometimes I can go two or three days without a birth. Sometimes I have two or three births in a day. So, um, yeah, I, I, I do love what I do. And already in this community, I feel like I can't walk down the street without meeting three or four people I've delivered. My kids and I've delivered everyone in Kingston. But it's not true. There are currently 12 of us in Kingston in one clinic. And um, the hopes of another clinic opening it in a few more years. So that's where we stand today. <coughs> Any questions? triangle building that used to be an old family docks building it's near skeleton park so we do if I'm on call then I'm not there I'm just at my house waiting for calls and I do home visits so those are the on-call midwife does the home visits on Wednesdays like today I switch with my partner and I start clinic and I do clinic clinic Wednesday Thursday Friday Monday Tuesday and then we switch again on so one of us is always on call and one of us is in clinic and that's where we're based out of is um, the community midwives of Kingston clinic on Barry Street yeah. So women come in for their appointments, just like seeing your family doc when you're pregnant. You come in every four weeks up until 28 weeks, then you come in every two weeks till 36, and then you come in every week until your baby comes. And yeah, when, we, when something happens um, with a woman in her care, whether it's prenatally or in her labor and birth or in the postpartum, what I do when it's outside of my scope, we have a college of midwives, I have a scope of practice. When it falls outside my scope, I consult. And normally I'm, a, I'm consulting with an obstetrician. Sometimes if it's in the postpartum, I might consult with a family doc if they have a different thyroid issue going on or something I don't know about. But we also have a large pharmacopoeia of drugs where we can prescribe antibiotics and, and most normal things that pregnant women might need, we're also able to prescribe. So, yeah. I would just, uh, it's not a question, but a comment. You said you would have sort of the similar training to a GP, but so my experience of midwives is in Britain. Uh, my first son was born in Britain. And the GP there said to me, the midwife would have far more training than I have because I had a six week stint within my medical training on right. childbirth. Midwife has been doing it sort of a longer training than I've also <laughs> practicing. So he said, you know, in Britain, at least the midwives are sort of the specialists. Right. Um, so I just wanted to comment. I that wish I wish they thought of, of experience us. and, and <clears throat> expertise. Yeah. That's probably the case. I wish they thought of us that way. And I actually am ashamed of myself for including in that talk because I try and make the profession sound. I mean, I think doctors and a lot of professionals get more credit than they do. And but the you know the population knows all about docs or family mm -hmm. docs or family physicians. Mm -hmm. So I try and raise us up to that level so that people know that we're not just. You know, it's not just a six-week yeah. course I took on the weekend, and now I'm a midwife, yeah. right? We're so, all on line. We're on the line. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, people have so many misconceptions. Yeah. I have to sort of say, I'm like a family doc, so that they realize I'm family docs, midwives, we're all self-employed, in the sense that my paycheck comes from a transfer of payment agency, and I'm hired by the clinic, just like family docs. Mm -hmm. We're all self-employed. Uh, but yeah, I know you caught me on that one, because... We actually do do more births, obviously, than a family doc, because they have everything else in their practice. Um, has anybody, I shouldn't have this tape, but you can tape it. Has anybody heard recently about midwives fighting for an increase in pay? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting topic, and I, and I hesitated to be recorded about it, because I feel very differently than some other midwives, in that I think we are actually financially compensated quite well as midwives, but I think we've overcompensated other professionals. So I think I work as hard as a physician, I, I am not specialized like an obstetrician whose insurance is also four times what mine is, so they need to get paid more. But I don't think that I'm underpaid as a midwife. I think we've overpaid other professions, you know. But I don't think I'm going to get them to come down <laughs> to our level, <laughs> so, yeah. Well, is it the case now, then, that if a family doctor uh, delivers a baby, he gets compensated at a different level than a midwife? No, it's, it's, a, it's just a totally different fee system. Scenario. Yeah, no. they actually would get paid for the delivery. The funny thing about my pay, um, which no obstetrician understands, or OB, we talk a lot with the OB residents, and they think we're crazy, because I get paid exactly the same if I'm with that woman who delivered four minutes after I walked through the door last week, 
or if I'm with the woman for 24 hours before she delivers, I go off for sleep, I come back and she still hasn't delivered. I can be with them for 40 hours and I get the exact same pay as the one that took four minutes. So my, my initiative to be with that woman doesn't come from a connection to my pay, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't. Um, yeah, I'm not getting paid for the service of delivering my baby. Um, I delivered in uh, New York City with a doula and a midwife, but in the hospital, and um, it was it, it was just so beneficial to have a team of advocates who it seemed like there was a different way that they could talk to me during the process to really encourage strength and power in your you know it, the whole psychological experience I think was quite different and I had a birthing plan right. Um, so that, uh, because the cesarean uh, rates are really high in New York City, mm -hmm. and um, just to try to keep things on track of, you know, this is the way I'd like it to go, I mean, of course if it had to be a cesarean, <coughs> then right. fine, but some people um, sometimes choose that over um, a natural birth, and, you know, so I felt that I was well prepared with the team, because walking, I walked into the hospital, and they were trying to get me to sign, and I was you know, completely out of it, and they wanted me to sign all these sheets, I just couldn't read it, and you know, my husband was parking the car, and you kind of need your team of advocates, the doula was there saying, here, I'll help you with this, you know? Yeah. Um, otherwise, I would have been on my own. Yeah, I think we definitely have a role to play, I mean, on first <coughs> go to C-section too, we're not, you know, we're not wonder miracle makers. We have women who go to C-section, but I think we still have a role, and the hospital definitely recognizes that role. When you have a midwife and you go into cesarean section, I, and we're helping nurses and other caregivers. Unfortunately, our healthcare system doesn't pay enough to have more nurses in the OR when you go to C-section. But I am there simply to make sure the babe can come out and still look skin to skin with mom. So she's lying there, and I pull down her shirt, and I get the baby tucked in. And nurses would love to do that. They, they don't have pants. They're still circulating. They're still getting into They're still doing everything else. And they look at us and think, too, we'd like to do that, too. Mm -hmm. But we still have a big role in uh, advocating for women, even if we transfer their care for a complication. Um, and I forgot to say the exciting thing, which I'm sure you might, might have seen, is that there is a lot of work now at, at KGH. We um, only, if you're with a midwife, which kind of makes this feel special. <laughs> we had a whole bunch of calls saying, can I get a midwife now? I, but it's only with midwives because we're trained. Um, the OBs and docs and nurses haven't been trained to do water birth. So if you have a midwife and want a water birth, um, you can do them at KGH now. Like we're hoping now. Mm -hmm. No, we're hoping it grows. At this point, we still have our pools from the clinic. We have several pools that get rented out. We have two of them that live at KGH now, and the family has to buy the liner and the few extras. And in labor, dad gets it blown up, and we, yeah, we can have a water birth, which is really exciting. We've had about 10 now in the last four months, but they've all been very successful, and it's the buzz at KGH, and we feel very supported by KGH in allowing us to do this. And if it continues to grow and do well, we will get a birthing tub at KGH, hopefully. Um, I started in a pool at home, and it was so much nicer than mm -hmm. dealing with gravity. It's just, it's very hypnotic. I think water in any form. I'd love to do a study sometime. And if a woman stood laboring in the middle of a room and you just poured a glass of water over her, or her belly or her back, wherever she's feeling the most pain, I swear it would help. Because there's something about water and hydrotherapy that is just really great. So we're excited that KGH is moving ahead. Yeah. Any other questions? <coughs> is there any push in Ontario for birthing centers? There are. There, we have two now. It, they've just happened in the last two years. One is one is in Ottawa, which is huge. Uh, it, it's gonna it's going to service 300 350 women a year, and the other one is in Toronto. We thought of proposing one in Kingston, but the sheer numbers that you have to, to put for the proposal, we didn't have the numbers. So are they, but, yeah, are they typically attached to hospitals or separate? Um, both. They they can be attached. They can be very close by, like somewhere on campus, even though KGH is there. Yeah, and Quebec mostly has birth cent centers. They don't do many home births. Most of the Quebec births happening with midwives are in a birthing center. Yeah, good question. So. Can I, I just say, I don't have a question, but you have a comment. <clears throat> so I had my kids long before this, right? My yeah. husband was 1990. And uh, I think the emphasis was on what could go wrong. And yes. They were always looking at what could go wrong with the baby, and they were treating it like it was an illness. Yeah. Right? And so I was like strapped, you know, with this 
monitor and they're very uncomfortable, right? Yes. And so I think it's really interesting that you said you look after the women. Because yeah. I felt like nobody mm -hmm. was looking after the women. Like yeah. we were supposed to sign these forms and sign away all of our control and yeah. and when stuff had to get done they sort of shooed the husband off so that there'd be no <coughs> interference, there'd be no advocate. And uh, it's really interesting because um, when I was in there got to stay until your baby replaced their birth weight. Right. So three Which to five be, days. Well, it can even be more. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, because breastfeeding, yeah, you know, it could take up to three weeks some people take to replace right. birth weight. So for me, my resource was actually the other women who'd already had a baby. Because yeah. you're on a ward of several women, so you're actually yeah. getting, you're learning about what to do from other women who've gone through it. But if everybody's leaving, they're all isolated. Yes. How are they going to learn anything? And that's healthcare dollar problem, you know, that those women with no midwife are being discharged home at 24 hours. And so, what do they? Is there some kind of mothers group that they join? There are lots because of mothers group, but you don't want them leaving home. The public health tries to fill that gap. Public health will call them between day three and day seven at home if they haven't had a midwife. They know, like, you're registered with midwives. They don't bother calling you, but if you're not, then they'll call you at home. They'll come visit if you if. I have one of those. In four kids, I have one of those visits. Public health. Yeah, I yeah. know. It's not. It's not the same. It, yeah. It's not. I, I'm excited by how, how the pendulum is swinging because certainly the 1950s and 60s when it was this medicalized event and we thought we were doing great bringing in more machinery, more medicine, getting the dads out of the room and now the pendulum's swinging back and it's wonderful. It's, it's really exciting and, and people still see, see home birth as high risk and like that people are taking uh, you know, the baby's life in their hand by having a home birth without any knowledge of our skill level, how long we've been trained, what we bring to a home birth. That being said, we live in a community with a level three hospital, but if you've ever worked in a level one hospital, we don't have the resources that they do at KGH. Right. But you know, I'm also thinking that a hospital is for sick people, so when you go to a hospital, you're exposing your newborn to a whole bunch of diseases yeah. that you wouldn't if you were at home. Absolutely. Your own germs and bacteria is much better than, yeah, for sure. And we're very neat. People have this, this other idea that birth is like, extraordinarily messy and there's a lot of dads, a lot of cleanly <laughs> conscious dads these days that don't want home birth because it's not messy. <laughs> it's not. If you can stand one story, this was years ago in Niagara and uh, I convinced this dad, it was the third baby, good Dutch family. In Niagara, lots of them have eight or nine kids so I was lots of business and uh, the dad didn't want any at home because it was messy. I'm like, sure, no, no, it's not messy. We're very clean. We're very neat. And I've never seen this before. I've never seen it since. They were living in a nice brand new home and Birth, uh, the bed was here, she was getting ready to push. We we're kind of standing in different places, and her water broke. And it was like a slow motion thing where it flew across the room and it hit the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, I've never seen that before. <laughs> and I've never seen it, so it wasn't that, that clean that time. But we do, we clean up the well, he, he knew. Yeah. <laughs> it was so splash. Yeah, but lots of fun stories. I think that's part of being a midwife, too. We love to tell stories. Um, of course, we remove names, but amongst ourselves, it's all about the story. And every birth is different. You know, I've been a midwife for uh, 10 years, and every birth is different. You're surprised almost every time. So that's why I do it. Does the midwife um, make a home visit pre or postnatal? We post do delivery? usually do one home visit beforehand at 36 weeks, mm -hmm. just so we have an idea of where their home is, because mm -hmm. we're going to be going out in the middle of the night by ourselves to find mm -hmm. it. And you know, just to see what their home environment's like, certainly if they're having a home birth. And we do up until that 10 days postpartum, all at home. And then they come back to clinic for two week, four week, and six week. At six weeks, we discharge their care back to their family doc. Yeah. Good can you tell us what all this stuff on the table Yeah, I can. Mm -hmm. This is um, my suction. So if baby came out and needed suction, I have my suction catheter and my suction pump. I have oxygen, I have Sometimes babies come out and need a bit of resuscitation, so I have my oxygen with me. I also have maternal oxygen. I didn't pull out my big tank. Uh, sometimes moms need that in labor as well. I have all of my equipment for IVs at home. Uh, we have sometimes a postpartum hemorrhage and we need IVs, so I've got all my uh, needles and bags of IV fluid, although here we have to send them with an IV fluid bag home because ours all freeze in our cars. <laughs> So we have lots of frozen IV bags in our cars, so we have to make sure everyone has one in their home as well. Um, also for baby, we, we now have a pulse oximeter at home. We have things to intubate baby if baby's struggling after they're born. Um, we have, oh goodness, 
all um, some of my medications are in here for postpartum. The two big emergencies at home or any birth are postpartum hemorrhages and babies that need to be resuscitated. So these are my postpartum hemorrhage drugs and my resuscitated drugs. I have instruments to suture if I need to suture at home, so someone up. Delivery instruments and yeah, that's the basics. But at a level one hospital, we you would have this. The only thing we don't have is enough hands. Sometimes you know in an emergency you like lots of hands. And I always think I wish I had a couple of nurses in my trunk too. But mm -hmm. <laughs> that's so uh, yeah, that's pretty much the basics. You know, birth hasn't changed uh, over the hundreds of years. There's really you know they try and bring in more, but there's not much more than that. Yeah. What does the midwife record about uh, episiotomies compared to doctors? Well, nowadays, to be really fair, uh, doctors um, aren't doing episiotomies either. No one's doing them unless it's an emergency. Luckily, I trained a long, well, long time ago, 10 years ago, with an uh, obstetrician. We do a large um, obstetrical placement and when we're becoming midwives for three months. So the OB that I worked with 10 years ago did episiotomies on everyone, as was the old school. And it sounds awful, but as a student, I got the best training because there are lots of midwives and obstetricians graduating from school that have never done one because we've stopped doing them. I actually feel more confident that I could do one with no hesitation in an emergency, but we're not doing them routinely. Doctors or midwives, yeah. Have you ever done one? Pardon? Have you ever done oh, one? Oh, lots. Well, I did the 30 in my placement. Right. And then, yes, and it's not fun. It's not a, a symbol, but when you see a heart rate that's going down and it's the quickest way because the baby's right there, quickest way to get that baby out with a bad heart rate is to do an episiotomy. Mean, you don't hesitate. You really don't. Yeah. So. Yeah. So what's the pelvis? How, how much, I'm curious, how much does the pelvis actually move? Well, it moves, it moves more throughout your pregnancy than actually the birth. Um, there's a lot of hormones get released to release all these ligaments and they create those few extra millimeters you need to get your baby out. The baby is the one that determines the length of the labor all of the time. So a baby in a great position like this comes out no problem. It puts its head out and comes through the pelvis after it restitutes perfectly. But if a baby decides to stay in labor like this for a long time, it's not going to come out. If the baby decides to stay like this for a long time, it's really an exact science. So I don't think people realize that labor length really depends on baby's position. So the better the baby is in the position, the quicker the labor. Yeah. But the pelvis is opening throughout the pregnancy. Like just creating a little extra space. Yeah. So how much does the pelvis actually, how many millimeters does it typically? I don't know. Yeah. I, I would say millimeters, but I don't say centimeters, just ever so slightly. Yeah. Babies' um, bones are a lot softer, as you know, as well. So they mold to the shape. I'm always, I'm, I try and warn dads beforehand how funny the child may look when it comes out because they're often thinking there's been brain damage because they have this cone head like Marge Simpson and they're all squishy and but they'll come down in 24 hours but that's what they how they adapt to come through right so yeah. I can just keep talking so I'll stop <laughs>